June 22 is the date of this email. Boy, that Timberwolf was one deal. How much of that deal did you sell to your clients? It's gambling. Pure and simple, raw gambling. There's no doubt their behavior was unethical and the American people will render a judgment as well as the courts. Could you give me a yes or no to whether or not you considered yourself to have a duty to act in the best interests of your clients? I believe that we have a duty to serve our clients well, 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 well. I guess, Mr. Chairman, that I'm not going to get an answer to my question any more than you did. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. The stock market is now down 21%. Because we're now down 43%. Down, down. We're down over 16%. It was the worst day on Wall Street since the crash of 1987. America has been hit by the worst financial crisis in history. What started out as an amazing decade has come to a halt with a bang. Millions have lost jobs, homes and some even their lives. By the end of it, the world economy has lost $2 trillion, more than any Robin Hood option trader ever could lose. And at the center of it all, is one investment bank. You might think that crises hurt banks, but no, the most powerful investment bank of all emerges unscathed. In fact, Goldman Sachs continues to prosper and today it is more powerful than ever, raking in billions in profits through shady methods. What was really the problem is that they uh, made a heck of a lot of money in the wrong way, in an unfair way at the expense of taxpayers. And their assets keep growing. First, the 1929 Great Depression, then the 1998 banking crisis, and now the biggest crash in history. Goldman has consistently grown despite crises, with their assets totaling $1.44 trillion today. How does Goldman Sachs make profits during disasters? What gives them their mysterious image being virtually untouchable in the world of finance? And most importantly, who are the men behind this juggernaut ruling the finance world? We, we did not cause the financial crisis. Some great bankers start as rich trust fund kids, some as grandsons of rich trust fund kids, and some start as peddlers. Marcus Goldman is not like the stereotypical Goldman Sachs banker. Secure upbringing, elite education, a prestigious career track. No, Marcus has nothing to lose. Now, with his horse-drawn mini shop, he's an equivalent to modern day drop shippers. He has low margins, no brand mode, and a low bank account balance. But he has one more thing, the determination to build a great life for himself, his 19-year-old wife and his kids. And where do you go if you are looking for opportunities to make it big? There is just one place.
Marcus has noticed something. Banks in the 1860s are very conservative with their loans. They only give loans to the big merchants with big bank accounts, leaving small merchants struggling to get finance for their businesses. The merchant business is all about managing your working capital. And if banks don't lend you money, this can affect cash flows quite negatively. Jewelers, tanners, and other retailers in New York often receive IOUs from their customers. These promissory notes hurt retailers' cash reserves, as many have to pay their raw materials and cash only to get these IOUs. Promissory notes are a legal instrument in which one party promises in writing to pay a determinate sum to another. It's a bit like when you're a cash-constrained socialist that uses buy now, pay later services frequently. So where to get cash from in the short term if banks don't lend you money because you're too small? Goldman. Armed with ambition and a knack for numbers, he sets up shop in a one-room basement office at 30 Pine Street, New York City, working alone to keep costs down, but dressed sharply in a Prince Albert coat and tall hat, Goldman pays merchants cash for their promissory notes at 8% to 9% below face value. Merchants are happy to get quick access to cash at better terms than banks would provide. Goldman then sells the notes to commercial bankers at a 1.5% commission. Within a few months, Goldman is dealing with commercial papers worth millions of dollars. There's just one problem. It's not always easy doing business if there's family involved. In 1882, Goldman invites his son-in-law Samuel Sachs to join him in the business and changes the firm's name to M. Goldman and Sachs. Business booms and soon the firm is turning over $30 million worth of paper a year. There's just one problem. As a startup investor, I would say Samuel Sachs is the diametral opposite of the stereotypical entrepreneur that builds a massive business. He's conservative, cautious and likes to take things things slowly. This could have been the end of Goldman Sachs' ambitious rise if it wasn't for one man. Marcus Goldman's youngest son, Henry Goldman, joins the family business in 1885. They were very much yin and yang, the brothers-in-law. Henry Goldman, the more daring trader, the partner who thought that the firm needed to expand, and Sam Sachs, the more conservative banker who wanted to stay with what they knew. In a process later described by the firm's PR as creative tension, <laughs> the two relatives are very successful in expanding the business at first. After their father retires in 1897, the firm is left in the hands of the two. What they don't know is that they are about to have a fight about the most lucrative business opportunity in finance, the underwriting business. By 1890, the firm is one of the largest commercial paper dealers in the country. But the prospects of growth are dwindling as more and more commercial dealers set up shop to replicate Goldman's success. Henry and Samuel Sachs, who have been running the business side by side, agree it's time for some changes. What changes? Well, that's a different question. Henry Goldman is much more risk tolerant than Samuel. This creates tension in the daily business, but it's Henry's next suggestion that threatens to put the firm deep into enemy territory. He wants to grow the firm beyond his father's dream, even if that means venturing into a new hostile market. A market that they've so far been denied on the basis of their race. A market that will put them at loggerheads with the big bankers of this period, including JP Morgan, the underwriting business. Which industry? The most powerful one back then, the railroad business. Business. 
Underwriting is the process by which a bank or a group of banks evaluates the risk associated with an IPO and agrees to purchase shares of the offering at a set price. And in the US back then, the most powerful industries were oil, steel, and of course, railroads. With America's economy booming, taking companies public is the new big deal. Henry wants a piece of the cake. He wants to be the book runner in these new IPOs. Henry did go to Morgan and Spire and said, you know, I want to get into this business of underwriting railroads. And they looked at him and they said, we don't have any room for you. We really don't want you here. Henry goes back to the drawing board. Is it worth it getting into a fight with the Silverbacks? What if rather than go for the already established railroad companies, he will focus on underwriting young, less established companies? It's certainly going to be riskier, but it could also be incredibly lucrative if it works. Underwriting young businesses is a risky affair that requires serious capital injections. Next to the industries mentioned earlier, retail was also a growing industry. Historically, these entities had relied on bank loans and commercial paper for funding. But as they started expanding further, they required more capital. That's where Henry sees a massive opportunity. There's only one problem. Other than railroad companies, retailers do not have massive amounts of hard assets on their balance sheets. Traditionally, businesses were valued based on the assets on their balance sheet. You don't need to also have worked in M&A to realize that that is a quite naive approach. But Henry Goldman advocated a new approach to valuation based on a company's ability to generate income and ultimately its earnings. Henry Goldman goes on a hunt first to find a bank that will finance his humongous ambitions and secondly to find a business that will make his dreams come true. He accomplishes both. He partners with one of the most notorious financial institutions ever. And that was when he got together with Philip Lehman and started underwriting retail companies. As we started to develop a banking business, a lot of our clients were retailers or textile companies or apparel companies. That was our great area of strength. And so one of the early IPOs we looked at was Sears in 1906 for just that reason. Next thing you know, Henry takes Sears Roebuck public and F.W. Woolworth public. He combines three cigar companies, merges them and takes them public. Today, this does not sound special. Retailers go public without problems and cigar companies probably doubled their valuations since Andrew Tate. But back then it was a revolution, something that was always considered super risky and that ended up working. Goldman Sachs becomes a specialist in underwriting. In the next years, they go on to underwrite 114 issues for 56 new public companies. Goldman Sachs is the gold standard, but the coming world war will split the company in half. When World War I begins, it does not only put the world order to the test, it also challenges Goldman Sachs' internal power structure. Banks are always involved in one way or the other when it comes to financing wars. But as it turns out, Henry and Samuel were standing on opposite sides of World War I. It was a very big split. Samuel and Harry, his brother, who was a partner by then, were extremely anxious to join the big bond issue that Morgan had originated. And Henry thought that the Germans definitely were in the right. And they screamed and yelled at each other constantly. A war ensues within the confines of Goldman Sachs buildings and the ultimate casualty is Henry Goldman. He decides to retire and takes with him 15 partners and their capital, decimating the firm. And from that point onward, the two families, the Sachs and the Goldmans, never speak again. With a vacancy left to fill, a new man is about to join the firm. A two-faced man that will not only transform the company, but also bring it down to its knees. 
This very man, like thousands of other hungry students, needed to apply and get a job at Goldman Sachs first. We all know how desirable a career in high finance is today, mostly for the extremely high salaries and amazing exit opportunities into private equity, venture capital and other industries. But we also know that hundreds of thousands of candidates get rejected during the application phase each year. So before we explore Goldman Sachs and how one man almost ended the firm. Let's take a look how you could become part of Goldman with the help of today's sponsor, Wall Street Oasis. With more than 17 years of experience helping students break into their dream high finance jobs, they know how to get you one of those lucrative roles. The success of their students speaks for itself, as they have landed positions at all of the top firms. With the academy, you will get access to vast resources, including including exclusive networking resources, courses and unlimited support. And it's not only for target school or 3.7 plus GPA students, they have helped applicants from all backgrounds to greatly increase their chances to land that high finance job. In fact, they are so confident in the success of the program that they will give you a guarantee to receive a job offer in high finance or you get your money back. The onboarding process is very selective, so click the link in the description now to apply to the waitlist and you will be near the front of the line. Now back to Goldman Sachs. Weddell Catchings is handsome, tall and confident. Not only that, but he's also an absolute finance chad. How could a silverback like this possibly do any harm to the firm? Catchings joins the firm as a senior partner. It is 1918, the time of the roaring 20s. Weddell has always had a high risk appetite, even in his early days of his career restructuring bankrupt companies. And now that America is experiencing the roaring 20s, it feels like the best time to capitalize on his insatiable risk appetite. Weddell decides to venture into the realm that will later combine both genius quants and extreme degeneracy, the trading business. Everything about Waddell Catchings was antithetical to Goldman Sachs. First of all, he was an outsider. He wasn't somebody who came up through the ranks of the firm. He was the only person I can think of who came straight in at the top. He was a person who very much believed in short-term profits couldn't have cared less about the future of the firm. In 1928, Catching sets up a trading corporation and calls it the Goldman Sachs Trading Corporation. The corporation raises almost $100 million from an initial investment of $10 million. When people get wind of this new investment fund, they drop everything to join the party. Catchings goes on to add more trusts with an interlocking, highly leveraged ownership structure, a recipe for disaster if market sentiments change. In the 1920s, the great American word was prosperity. Now the 30s have begun and there is a new word, depression. The bubble bursts in the morning of 29th October 1929. The share price of the Goldman Sachs Trading Corporation plummeted from a peak $326 per share to $1.75. Investors don't only lose millions, they also lose their confidence. And Weddell Catchings loses his job. He was caught up in this broad belief that the business cycle was just this one directional thing. And that put the institution at great risk. And when it collapsed, it could have ended Goldman Sachs right then and there. In November 1907, Sidney Weinberg joins Goldman Sachs as an assistant to the janitor. And when he bumps into Weddell Catchings in the hallway, none of them would have ever imagined that both of them will get their shot at running the firm one day, one more successfully than the other. When you hear Sidney Weinberg's story, picking the tallest building on Wall Street, going floor by floor by floor, looking for a job, cleaning spittoons, 
uh, working in the mailroom, that sort of thing. It sounds like every movie you've ever seen, every cliche book you've ever seen, except of course it's true. Starting with $5 per week salary as an assistant to the janitor, he demonstrates epic attention to detail, so much so that Paul Sex takes notice. Fascinated by his raw talent and charisma, Paul pays for Weinberg's first investment banking course in New York University, a decision that would save the firm in the near future. Weinberg's career takes off. He becomes a senior partner at Goldman Sachs in the 1930s at the height of the bubble. And thanks to his integrity and an innate ability to build relationships, Weinberg does not only strengthen Goldman Sachs after the crisis, he also leads the largest IPO in America, an IPO that will forever have its place in finance history. The dream of every investment banker was to take Ford Motor Company public. A company whose founder was a staunch anti-Semitic. A company that believes Wall Street is a haven for wolves. A company that will make anyone millions who takes it public. In the years leading up to the IPO, Henry Ford II had turned to Weinberg for counsel. Ford wants to restructure the company in a way that will cede some of the control and voting rights to those outside the immediate Ford family. Sidney seizes this opportunity and treats the Ford company like his own. He helps restructure the company and puts up a plan that allows Henry Ford to take his company public. In 1956, they go public. The IPO is a success. They rake in more than $657.9 million from just 10.2 million shares. The biggest IPO to that date. Sidney Weinberg establishes himself as the ultimate king of Wall Street, with other going so far as calling him Mr. Wall Street. But while Sydney is taking victory laps, another man is raking in millions inside Goldman Sachs trading department. This man would go on to completely overhaul how Goldman Sachs does business and under his reign Goldman Sachs reputation will be put to the test once more. Up until this point, Goldman Sachs' main activity is investment banking. But when I talk to my finance friends nowadays, most of them also mention Goldman Sachs' trading department as a viable career strategy. Back then, Goldman has a small trading department, but partners are beginning to take notice. This department is headed by Gus Levy. Joining the firm in 1933 as a trader on the foreign bond desk, Gus quickly rises through the ranks as a senior partner by 1940. 45. One great legacy from Gus is that Goldman Sachs had really not taken trading risk until Gus started doing this. So Gus pioneered that. He identifies an opportunity for growth, block trading. Buying or selling large blocks of stock can influence the market. And the blocks of stock coming over the stock exchange were not 1,000 share blocks. They ended up by being 250,000 share blocks. The specialists couldn't handle it. So what happened is Gus said, hey, listen, if you come in with a block that you need to buy, call me, I'll go join an account with you and we'll sell it together. They buy large amounts of stock, hoard them, then slowly sell them back into the market at a markup. By 1976, the firm is handling an average of more than 100 million shares annually. But the harder they rise, the harder they fall. And with increased leverage, Goldman Sachs becomes more vulnerable. four decades since the Great Depression. Americans have forgotten about the mess Wall Street put them in. So it's no wonder Gus Levy agrees to issue commercial paper for an ailing railroad. The Penn Central Railroad is the largest railroad in the country after a merger with New York Central. However, the merger comes with $1.2 billion of debt. They turn to Goldman Sachs and ask for $100 million in commercial paper. National Credit, a credit rating company, 
gives the railroad an excellent rating. A big mistake as it turns out. They only give that rating because Goldman Sachs is underwriting the commercial paper. Unbeknownst to them, Goldman Sachs is using the AAA credit rating to issue more paper. The vicious cycle continues until $87 million worth of commercial paper have been issued and nobody thinks that's a problem. And we had $87 million of commercial paper outstanding of Penn Central Railroad when they went bankrupt. Investors feel cheated. They demand compensation from Goldman Sachs because of misrepresentation. So basically making investors feel that this was a safe deal when in fact it wasn't. The court agrees with the investors and Goldman Sachs is directed to pay back 20 cents on the dollar to investors. A PR disaster for Goldman. But financially? Goldman Sachs pulls out their ace of cards. All the while they had insured their bet against the railroad bankruptcy. An absolute power move, which reminds me of Bill Ackman. A big inspiration when I think about my own career in finance and media. So whatever fines Goldman Sachs is being charged with, their insurer is paying it all. Trading is a tough business. By 1976, the firm has taken a toll on Gus Levy. Midway through a board meeting in New Jersey, Gus drops dead from a stroke. What comes next is a new era of military-like leadership at Goldman Sachs. It's the best of times. America is going through another bout of economic success. But with Gus gone, Goldman must restructure itself. John Weinberg, son of the late Sidney Weinberg, assumes half control of the firm's management committee. The other half of the puzzle is a no-nonsense man. A man that has served as a US Navy commander in World War II. His mission is one. Undo what Gus Levy has done by restructuring Goldman Sachs exactly like a military base. Under his reign, Goldman Sachs turns into the kind of Goldman Sachs masochistic analysts brag about on LinkedIn nowadays. First order of business? Establishing his authority. No one will enter his office unnecessarily. No one leaves the office until their work is done. And true to his words, by 1983 his efforts bear fruits. The firm brings in $400 million in profits, a 60% increase from the previous year. Not only not only does this improve the image of the firm, especially after its previous fumbles, investors regain the trust that is so near and dear to Goldman Sachs' success. And the timing couldn't have been any better, because America is entering a bull market. Mergers and IPOs are the order of the day. Goldman Sachs positions itself as a white knight by representing only the targets of hostile bids. They become the saviors of firms slated to be taken over by ruthless investors. So we end up by being about the only company that didn't do unfriendly tenders. But even before the firm could take off under his leadership, White House poaches John Whitehead. He goes on to become President Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State leaving the firm in the hands of another dynamic duo. What he doesn't know, the two new senior partners will not survive in the firm for more than five years. In come Stephen Friedman and Robert Rubin. Friedman has joined the firm's management in 1982 in the mergers and acquisitions department. In fact, he's the reason Goldman Sachs defends targets of hostile bids in the 80s. Rubin, on the other hand, has built Goldman's options department from scratch. Bob Rubin was the first person in a major management role who really understood risk. Trading risk was going to be one of the most important things that all the banks and investment banks would need to learn about through the 80s, 90s and into the 21st century. And he was the person who really understood that. 
However, these hostile takeovers begin causing jitters among investors and attracting the keen eye of Rudy Giuliani, an up-and-coming attorney eyeing the mayor of New York office. He takes it upon himself to ensure that he finds evidence to link top traders of Goldman Sachs to cases of insider trading. This affects Goldman Sachs' reputation and for a while shakes investor confidence. But that's not even their main concern. There's an even bigger threat. They don't have enough capital. The trading department at Goldman Sachs has ballooned beyond their wildest dreams. In 1993, Goldman is raking in profits of $2.7 billion, a large percentage of that coming from trading. But there's a problem. By the 90s, many of the partners who had big stakes in the trading business are retiring, taking out their capital from the firm and leaving. Goldman needs a capital injection and it needs it fast. An IPO would be the obvious choice, but it's not uncontroversial. And there were very passionate views on both sides. One of the most debated points was this concept of the partnership. And would we lose that when we went public? While going public guarantees them almost unlimited capital, they risk losing control of the firm. Furthermore, the firm has been run as a partnership for a century. And now, with two senior partners at the helm, John Corzine and Hank Paulson, they must purge one. Because a public company can only have one king. It's down to war. John Corzine versus Hank Paulson. Question, who do you think will win? One of the greatest downfalls in the history of finance is about to take place. A hedge fund formed by John Merriweather in 1994 has come crushing down. A hedge fund that was thought to be untouchable, employing genius mathematicians and Nobel Prize winners. They'd, they'd had in aggregate the 16 that probably had 350 or 400 years of experience doing exactly what they were doing. Super high intellect, working in a field they knew, and essentially they went broke. The missing puzzle in their mathematical model, a sovereign country defaulting on its bonds. Russia has defaulted on its obligations. Goldman Sachs had a stake in the fund and when shit hits the roof, they begin dumping their positions, exacerbating the problem even further. Within a blink of an eye, the hedge fund is decimated. To avoid a chain reaction in the capital markets and a catastrophic disaster in the financial system, the Federal Reserve comes to the rescue. They organize a bailout of $3.6 billion by the major creditors to avoid a wider collapse in the financial markets. And once again, Goldman Sachs survives another collapse scare. But they have not solved the internal power struggle yet. Comparing both men, it should have been obvious. Hank Paulson has built a strong rapport with partners. A Dartmouth College graduate and Harvard Business School MBA, he is also the top earner on the investment banking side. So clearly, he's the man for the job. In January 1999, he is named chairman and CEO of the soon to be publicly traded company. And on May 4th, 1999, a century later after Marcus listed the company on the NYSE, on the New York Stock Exchange, Goldman Sachs goes public. And Dick Grasso and Billy Johnson, chairman and president of the New York Stock Exchange, respectively. It's going to be a very successful publicly traded company as it was a very successful private uh, company as well. The goal is simple. One, to secure permanent capital to grow. Two, to share ownership among employees. And three, to permit Goldman to use its securities for strategic acquisitions. The IPO becomes one of the largest offerings in US history, with Goldman raising $3.657 billion for a stake of 15%. Armed with insurmountable amounts of capital, Goldman Sachs embarks on a journey to gain equally insurmountable amounts of power. I suspect when future historians write about this period, they will talk about Lloyd 
as one of the most impactful and decisive leaders in the annals of Goldman Sachs. He led us through the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. He ushered us into a more complex business environment in the aftermath of that. Lloyd Blankfein takes the reign of Goldman Sachs and they start off strong. Good morning, welcome to the White House. I'm pleased to announce that I will nominate Henry Paulson to be the Secretary of the Treasury. With an extension of Goldman Sachs planted in the government, the new CEO Blankfein embarks on a noble mission to put company profits first and clients second. His tool of choice to get there, mortgage-backed securities. By now, major departments in the Treasury are headed by investment bankers who champion policies that deregulate the banking sector. One of these policies permits banks to engage in hedge fund trading with derivatives Banks then demand for more mortgages to support the profitable sale of these derivatives. Within two years, Goldman has underwritten more than 200 billion of mortgage-backed securities. What they fail to mention to their clients is they have put up short positions against the same derivatives. between three and four and a half percent generally across these markets. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. The American mortgage euphoria has come to an astounding crash. Moody's decision to downgrade Bear Stearns mortgage-backed securities from B to C prompts a panic from hedge fund customers. This sparks a bank run, depleting Bear Stearns liquidity from $18 billion to just $2 billion in just two days. And with that, the stage is set for yet another crisis. We have Lehman Brothers filing for bankruptcy as the subsidiaries basically wind down or Lehman tries to sell them off. The bank declares bankruptcy after their highly leveraged securities come crashing down. Most banks in the country are caught Caught unaware holding trillions of dollars of worthless investments in subprime mortgages. To hedge their risks, the banks begin selling these subprime mortgages. Their largest buyer, Goldman Sachs. As Goldman buys them, they rebrand them as credit default swaps and sell them back to their investors. One of the traders is at the heart of SEC charges for allegedly misleading clients by selling financial products tied to mortgages that were expected to fail. A mortgage has always been a safe investment because there's security. But subprime mortgages had been extensively overpriced due to cheap credit in the market. So when the Federal Reserve starts raising interest rates, the entire market goes into distress. Suddenly, Americans can no longer repay these mortgages. Worse still, they can't sell their houses without owing money to their lenders. And when Lehman Brothers files for bankruptcy, all eyes shift to Goldman Sachs as the next casualty. But little do they know that Goldman Sachs has something else up their sleeves, a trick they've used since their inception. People who were coming to us for risk in the housing market wanted to have a security that gave them exposure to the housing market, and that's what they got. The unfortunate thing that the housing market went south very quickly, and so people lost money in it. Remember how Goldman Sachs created an entire separate subsidiary in the months leading up to the Great Depression? How about the Penn Central incident, where they insured their losses in case the railroad company went bankrupt? Now, they've done just that, this time for even bigger profits. How? By shorting the same CDS they are offering their clients. Come on, Mr. Sparks. Well, Mr. Should Chairman. Goldman Sachs be trying to sell, and by the way, it sold it, a lot of it after that date. Should Goldman Sachs be trying to sell a shitty deal? Well, can you answer yeah, that one? Can words, you answer that one, yes or no? There are prices in the market that people want to invest in things. I didn't use that term with respect to this deal. When the crash takes too long to happen, they dump some of their positions into the market, starting a dominoes effect. But that's not even the worst of it. Goldman Sachs insured the subprime mortgages with AIG, 
the largest insurance company in America. So when the CDS default, Goldman Sachs demands compensation from AIG amounting to billions. By the time AIG and the rest of the financial market realizes what is going on, Goldman Sachs is raking in billions both from AIG compensation and their short positions. The people wanted to have a security that gave them exposure to the housing market and that's what they got. 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 So in that spirit, I want to uh, ask you all to join me in welcoming the next chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs, uh, David Solomon. The new man at the top of the banking hierarchy is David Solomon. He is challenged with reforming the bank's culture, establishing a consumer banking offering and navigating scandals supported by Goldman Sachs, such as the 1MDB sovereign fund scandal declared by the United States Department of Justice as the largest kleptocracy case to date in 2016. Even though the glory of Goldman Sachs has been dwindling in the past, they have proven time and time again Again, the kings of investment banking are here to stay. So we all know, all of us as leaders of this organization, that the thing that sets us apart, that differentiates us, that makes us special, as Lloyd said, is the people of Goldman Sachs and our culture. If you want to dive deeper into Goldman Sachs, make sure to check out our biography of David Solomon, the current CEO of Goldman Sachs. He's not only a part-time DJ, but maybe one of the most impressive investment banking CVs out there.